And still, with all the gains that we've made, we've made some tremendous gains. The bottom line is the bottom line. And that bottom line is we're still getting injured. So why? Well, the system's broken. And so I'm going to lay some stuff out today that just comes from evidence-based stuff, science-based stuff. But it hasn't had the time. It's so fresh to be peer-reviewed. So I'm going to ask you to listen to your gut because that's what I ask my patients to do, too, is I'm going to tell you a lot of things. But the bottom line is they may or may not be right for you. Your guts will tell you. And also in physiology, we found that your guts actually have a brain, and so does your heart. So when you feel it in your gut or you feel it in your heart, you actually do. There's a way for those areas of our body to bypass our brain. They make decisions on their own. They've got a built-in nervous system and a brain that does that. So when you feel it in your heart and you feel it in your gut, learn to trust that. Um, you can stay, that, stay right there, thanks. So um, the idea behind alignment, right? If you don't have alignment first, no matter what you do in your st uh, mobility, stability, strength training, you're going to be off. And I use this analogy, and, and this is, uh, hasn't been used enough because everybody is still following the same model, trying to get stronger, bigger, faster, and they're ruining themselves. And most athletes have a, about a five to eight week period where they feel great and then something goes wrong. And you know what happens is they get hurt and they can't get, wait to get back to their training so they can do the same thing and repeat it over again. And I see this, I've seen it for years and years and years. Um, so alignment is critical. But alignment is only good if you understand how to breathe. So go ahead and move that again. Um, for the breath, let's talk posture one more thing, one more time. Dr. Sherrington, 1906, created this quote. He was a doctor of what they call reciprocal inhibition. And what that means is if I tighten my bicep, my tricep has to loosen up so that I can do that movement. He also created this, which is just perfect because we are in a jello mold and whatever we do in our lives over time we become that we start to look like that and as we'll talk in a minute we are what we eat think and do there's no other way around that besides great genetics um, okay so this posture thing so alignment um, it's all about efficiency and it's all about trying to line our bodies up in a place where we're actually using gravity to our advantage as opposed to disadvantage Obviously, the gal on the left's got some issues there. Um, she's got a head forward there. Whenever the head goes forward, all you need to do is move it one inch forward and you've doubled the weight of your head. Um, I work a lot with posture. I, I invented a taping system for surfers and volleyball players, beach volleyball players, back in the 80s and 90s, uh, where I brought kinesio tape over from Japan and I started to blend it with other different tapes because in the water and in the sand, it's not a conventional sport, so you can't tape somebody and wrap somebody and have the water and the sand not get into space. Um, so his physical therapist was prescribing the shirts to all the athletes that they treat. And, uh, you know, he saw it one day, he's going, what the hell are you doing prescribing all these athletes this, this shirt? We don't know if it works or not. This is just, this just could be a bunch of crap, like most things are, because as a medical director, I receive a lot of products and most of them aren't really what they, they say they are. So I wanted to know if it was real or not. So they put 60 professional pitchers in the shirt, they had them throw excuse me, they had 18 professional pitchers, they had them throw 60 pitches each. And what they found was just by putting this shirt on, they improved the speed by almost two miles an hour, which is giant. It's almost like a steroid injection if you're talking about Major League Baseball. And the, what was really significant to me and why I'm bringing it out here is that um, the average pain that the pitcher was in before they started throwing was a seven out of 10. It's called a VAS scale, a visual analog scale of pain. And when they were through score, uh, throwing, the average score was three. So not only did they perform at a higher level, but by be, the body being in alignment, it took out a lot of the stress that's in the body when you're in pain. So I think that's a really big take home too. Um, and then we, we did another study as well with overhead athletes. Um, and this was at UCI, they did a, uh, they're the national volleyball champions. They did a two year study with everybody wearing the shirt for two years and they had zero shoulder injuries, which is crazy. Um, playing professional beach volleyball and being a doctor for volleyball for many, many years, everybody's got a shoulder injury. So it was a really a big moment. So posture and movement are very, very important. No matter what the sport is, you've got to be in alignment. 
Okay, and here's a guy that worked on his alignment a lot too. And, and John, if you're here, thank you so much for the kind words that you. I didn't know. I didn't know you liked me that much. I was really nice of you um, during your talk. But John was so dedicated to improving his movement and did everything that he could, everything that I asked him to, um, to change his body. Um, John had terrible mobility in a lot of areas, as we all do. And there's not one athlete that I've ever worked on. And in fact, the three athletes that I showed you in the beginning, Patrick, Kobe, Kelly Slater, um, if I was to choose who had the worst movement in the, out of those three, you wouldn't believe me, it's, it's Kobe. I mean, Kobe, Kobe can't cross his legs like this without a lot of struggle. I was blown away. Put him on the basketball court, and he's a prima ballerina. This blew my mind and made a tremendous impact on my career direction because I'm seeing one of the best athletes I've ever seen in my life, and the guy can't move. It's just mind-blowing, but you put a ball in his hand, right, and it's just unbelievable. And I think that's the way with all of us. We conform to what we do the most. And if we've got a smooth movement in what we're doing, I guarantee you have terrible movement in other things. And I used the example of a prima ballerina. I've worked with dancers as well. And their flexibility is nuts, right? But their mobility isn't so good. So what's the difference between flexibility and mobility? We'll talk about that. OK, just kind of roll through these. I just wanted to show you all these athletes that are wearing the posture stuff. Um, they don't have to. They can wear whatever they want. In fact, they get paid a lot of money not to wear my stuff. But what you'll find is that you'll see many of these athletes now matriculating towards things that stimulate alignment, that stimulate their body awareness so that as they hit fatigue, their body's cued to be in alignment because that's the first principle of what we're talking about here is fitness. This is uh, something just to let you know that every year, every year you get a whole new body on the inside. How's that for a deal? Pretty good deal, right? Literally, you're losing millions of cells every day. And they're being replaced by what you eat, what you think, what you do. And the quality of those cells are based upon what you eat, think, and do. So this is a gal, 86 years old, and wanted to change her world. She wanted to get rid of that hump in her back. And so this is after about a year and a half. So she starts to take yoga. And she gets with this gal and sees her. She's got a program to do every day. And things start to change. So if we can look at that first picture, and now we look at where she's at today, if she can do it, what the hell are we doing, right? I mean, it's all about desire. And if we've got a body that is absolutely able to change like that, it's, it's called plasticization. So the more we can do a specific movement. And the more we put breath into that movement, the more change can happen. It takes 60 to 90 days to change a tissue, to change the look of a tissue by doing exercises or by modeling that tissue with new movement. So we can always create change. It's never too late. And not everyone's going to get the same result as she did, but um, I'm certainly encouraging to go in that direction, right? And by the way, bones every five to seven years change. So those change, too. There are a few cells in your liver, and there's some cells in your brain and in your heart that don't change. You only get one set, and that's it. But for the rest of you, you're constantly changing. Um, this is just giant right here, OK? This is, this is where we can all create a huge change in our health and in our, in, uh, our abilities to play sport. And that's with breath. And this is Brian McKenzie up here. He's the guy that created CrossFit Endurance. And then he quit because he didn't like what CrossFit was doing, which was going for numbers and speed and, and weights, as opposed to technique and biomechanics, which is what this guy's into. So now he's really into breath. He studied with Wim Hof. Anybody heard about Wim Hof out here? If you haven't, write that one down. Look it up. It's mind-blowing. Uh, he's got a video called Superhuman, where this guy threw breath has trained himself to walk up in a pair of shorts, no shoes, no jacket, walk up in a blizzard to the top of a mountain, walk back down, not even be cold, uh, swims under icebergs, um, injects himself under hospital settings with poison, and watches the immune system beat up on the poison just through his mind. Pretty wild stuff. Check it out. It's worthy. 
So Brian's doing a study with Stanford right now. And this is really cool. This is about nose breath, OK? Anybody heard about nose breathing? You know, who's into yoga and all that stuff? So nose breath is a really legit thing. And we really didn't know much about it other than it's what the yogis did for thousands of years. And in 1998, the Nobel Prize for Medicine was given to these three scientists that studied nose breath. What happens when you breathe through your nose is pretty crazy. We have this chemical called nitrogen oxide that's stored in our sinuses here. And when we breathe through the nose, it stimulates the dump of that nitrogen oxide into the blood. And when nitrogen oxide gets into the blood, what it does is it allows us to vasodilate or open up our bronchial tubes so that we accept more oxygen into our system. Hey, oxygen's pretty important, right? I mean, when we lose oxygen, we start getting old, we don't feel good, we lose energy, everything ages really quickly. So oxygen, good thing, good for the brain, et cetera. So what we're doing is we're, when we take this oxygen in through our nose and, and we get into the bronchioles, is it actually is absorbing more oxygen from 10 to 15% more just by breathing in through the nose. And what it also does is it creates, you can go ahead and switch it, thanks. You can you create um, all right one more <laughs> all right we create um, uh, pressure against the vagal nerve so if we all take a breath in through our nose right now um, what I want you to do when you do this is I want you to put one hand on your chest one hand on the belly and I want you to breathe in through your nose I'm not going to tell you how to do it I just want you to breathe in. And I want you to feel what hand moves. OK, real deep breath in. And then slowly let it out. Whose upper hand moved? OK. Lower hand? OK, lower hands win. Excellent. So here's what's happening. Um, when the chest moves, it flips the nervous system into our fight or flight system. So it's, it's called the sympathetic nervous system. And, and it jumps right into it. So we are automatically going in when we mouth breathe and we chest breathe. We are in fight or flight. Tough to play a golf match in fight or flight. When we nose breathe and we hold it for seven counts and then we slowly let it out with this sound, tongue against the roof of the mouth, it creates a pressure in the back of our throat. And that pressure bumps into a nerve called the vagus nerve. And that vagus nerve controls the nervous system. So when we let that breath out slowly, we're actually able to neuromodulate the nervous system and put ourselves into the zone. So who's not seen a sports event where right before a big play, somebody takes a huge breath, right? And then they're ready to go. They may not know what they're doing, but what they've done is just calm themselves, and they put themselves in the moment. When we're in fight or flight, we cannot be in the moment, which is where life lives, right? We're in the future, and that's where stress lives. So I went to this thing. I was invited to go to this thing called the NBA Think Tank. And my job was to be the outsider, the disruptor. So we had these guys that I've seen on the benches for since Michael Jordan's days, guys I really respect in training. And so everybody was giving great information out and so forth. But you know what I came with as a disruptor was the statistic that as fantastic as all these things are and the gains that we've all made in physiology and anatomy and medicine, sports medicine specifically, we are losing the battle. And so as much as I wanted to give these guys props, I really just said, hey, uh, my machine's broken, your machine's broken, our machine is broken. We've got to reinvent this thing because of these injuries. So my deal is now I train for recovery. I train athletes to recover better. I train athletes to undo the tension that are, that's been brought into the muscles by their sport-specific movements. It's critical. And then we take, and we take that athlete, and then we look at them, their 360 mobility. How well do they move? And as we spoke about before, what's the difference between mobility and flexibility? Well, flexibility is a measure of a length of a muscle. Mobility is how well your joints move. Okay, And you can't have great flexibility without great mobility, and vice versa. But what you'll find is that no one has it all. And like I said, even testing these ballerinas that have incredible ranges of motion, it's insane how many people, how many of those gals have terrible restricted joint mobility in certain directions. So that's another key thing to look for is that mobility. Um, and so 
when we spoke to the, the basketball guys, they were a bit offended with what, what I had to say, and I, I totally understood what they were, where they were coming from. But the idea here is that we're not here for ourselves, we're here for our athletes. We're here to teach people how to stay on the course for longer and have more success. So, um, and, and again, some of the NBA guys that we look at move, and here's some of the top 10 draft choices from a couple, couple years ago cannot move. They cannot do a squat. You know, and I would challenge everybody out here, how's your squat pattern? It's one of the most important patterns anybody can have as a golfer, critical to have a great squat pattern. And most people when they squat, squat into their knees as opposed to using the back of their body. We never learned to use the back of our body. And here's a little story why. This is just your classic foundation. If you don't have a strong foundation, no matter what you do, you're going to eat it. You're going to, you're going to be injured often. And as I mentioned, it's that five to eight week cycle. So these people that take an athlete, a first round draft choice, and what they do is they put them into the strength and conditioning game, and they want to get them bigger, faster, stronger. Well, I guarantee you, they're going to probably end up worse off than they ever were if they don't break themselves down and learn how to first be aligned, second, learn how to breathe, three, learn how to move, four, stabilize that movement by connecting your brain and your nervous system and your muscles together. And then if you've got time, go ahead and do all the strengthening you want. But I've, I, I haven't met that athlete who's got that kind of time. We can spend years, literally years, breaking them down, trying to get their alignment right, their mobility right, their breath right. Because when those things are connected, it allows you to move further on into the fitness category of getting uh, more stable and more strong. But if you try and put that strength out in front, and that's really the message today, is don't do strength training until you've got three-dimensionally you have great mobility, or you will ruin that athlete. You won't ruin them for about eight weeks, but you will ruin them because it takes about that long for the body to, again, start to change and morph into what you're actually teaching them to do. So creating the ultimate athlete, I thought this was a pretty cool little article, and it's got all these different body parts. It's got, uh, you know, the hands of Don Braidman and the brain of Gary Kaspinoff and the legs of uh, Usain Bolt and the feet of Michael Jordan and so forth. And, and that's all great. But go ahead and change that slide. Thanks. And these guys and gals, all great. They've got all these great attributes. These are all Olympic athletes. Look at all the sizes. They're all different. The shapes are all different and so forth. Um, what do they have in common? They all have to have connections to their nervous system, to their brain, and to their muscles, but also their eyes and their ears. You know, there's a thing called proprioception. Everybody, anybody heard that one? Okay. Awareness of your body parts in space. All right. Well, our eyes are about 40% of that. So understanding where things are, we have to have our eyes. We also have this thing called a fascial system, right? Everybody heard of the fascia? Well, when I was in school, first thing they did in, in dissection is they stripped away all the fascia because they thought it was just this wrapping for the muscles. And what we found out that now is fascia is a part of every cell in every system of your body. Every organ, it digs into every organ. If I move my hand this way, the skin on my big toe just moved. It's all connected. So how we're connected and the obstructions from me getting from my finger to my big toe make up how well I move or do not move. So it's really important to connect those things. All right. Yeah, if they have surgery, they basically had a stroke just above it and just below it. So if somebody has an MCL tear in their knee, right, um, they basically will have to really re-educate everything around there again. Think about it. Who's had a sprained ankle? Remember when you first are able to walk off that sprained ankle, where your eyes go? Like, you know where your foot's been. It's been there your whole life. But that's where the eyes go first, because you've lost that communication. You have to re-educate that. And everybody re-educates at a different speed. So this is where you, know, you can have an athlete for an hour, 
But what they do in those 23 hours after you see them, just like if I treat somebody, what they do in that 23 hours after that, that's really the treatment. That's really where the treatment's either going to take hold or it's not, right? So it's the information that you can give your athletes that is everything to them. What they do, how they sit, how they sleep. I mean, one of the biggest things we can ever do to help an athlete is to get them out of a chair. I mean, I've got some pretty good slides about that. Let's see this. Let's hold on one second. Leave that one up there. Just this, just this last tip here. The reason that I put that slide up with all the body parts on there is because that's how I learned anatomy. That's how I learned physiology. That's how I learned sports medicine. And it's not the right way. And this is probably a big re reason why we're broken. That's called the reductionist method. All right, it's taking, it's like you guys, taking a golf ball, taking a club, taking a player, going, that's all you need. You should be great at it. The reduction, so when I learned about the heart, I learned about all the valves, I learned about all the arteries going in there. Awesome stuff. I knew all about the heart now, but how the hell does it work with the body? Well, how does it work with this valve in my right leg here? We learned it in a reductionist way. So I, I've had to really learn sports medicine after school, because that's where the truth was. That's where the response is going to be. It has to be practical. And then, you know, you look at a golf swing and all the things that go into that. I mean, you guys have a hell of a job to try and put all this stuff together. And I'm hoping that some of the pieces that I'm throwing at you today, well, I don't expect you to completely shift your paradigm, but I, I would expect you to do some reading and look at how breath is connected to movement. How, and how just by changing that one thing can change your whole career and your health as an individual because it really helps your health too, learning how to breathe properly. Um, so this 24-7 thing, it's, it's, if you don't have the commitment from your players, um, you'll never get where you want to go uh, in my estimation, or at least as fast as you want to get there. It really takes you know, them changing how they move. It really takes them not sitting in a couch after a round. It really takes understanding that your body's going to mold to what you do, period. And so we've got to change these things. What you eat, think, and do. So what do you eat? You know, there's, uh, it's, you know, nutrition is a big part of sports medicine. So eat foods that are alive. Eat foods that were food 150 years ago. That's a good place to start. And by eat foods that are alive, I mean, I'm talking about plant-based foods, right? And foods that where if you're going to eat beef, make sure it's grass-fed. These things have a tremendous difference. What did I say at the beginning? We get a whole new body on the inside every year. Guess what it's made up of, folks? It's either, you're either going to have McDonald's quality cells or you're going to have, you know, that wild, fr that wild fresh fish cell. I'll take the fish, please. Thank you. Um, and then, OK, here's sports psychology. And any sports psychologists out there? I hope not. OK, perfect. Thanks. So am I. OK, well, don't, I don't want to ruin everything for you. But here's what a lot of my athletes have spent you know, a good 50 grand on. Uh, and it's good. And sometimes you need to hear it from an authority to really, really have it sink in. But it is about routine. You know, until your athletes are in a routine, until, until that athlete's Monday is the same as championship day on the weekend, they're going to have problems. They're going to they're gonna have mental problems because that championship day is way different than the last six days I spent. Every day has to be Groundhog's Day. When you eat, what you eat, when you sleep, how you wind down after a round. All those things need to be put into a routine if you really expect to do well. And I've seen the change. I've seen athletes go from middle of the pack to the top of the heap just by getting into a routine. Because now Monday, Monday's the same day as the day that I compete on. I feel great. I feel the same. And that's what you want to have them repeat is every day should feel the same. All right. Okay, I mean that speaks loudly enough, right? It's really just difficult to turn that club to turn the hips when the body's not aligned. Okay, sorry for being redundant there. And breathe, keep going. All right, we uh, sold on to that one. All right, okay. 
Good, we talked about the vagus nerve. Look at me getting ahead of myself. Okay. And again. All right, so the diaphragm, all right? We all got one of those suckers. We used to just think it was a muscle. Now there's a big argument, is it a muscle or fascia? Because it's one of the first things formed in our bodies. When the embryo is starting to be formed, it unrolls these carpets, these four carpets, and what they turn into are diaphragms. So we got four diaphragms, you know, not just this one that's here. We've got one in the pelvis, we've got one in the belly, we've also got one in the cranium. And they're all about breath, they're all about moving pressure through the body. And so diaphragm is really crucial for us to be an athlete. If we're not learning to take a diaphragmatic breath, if we're taking notes, that's the one you want to write down. We need to learn how to do a diaphragmatic breath. All right, and that's just the simple version I showed you just by taking a breath in through the nose, into the belly, but also into the back. We want to breathe three-dimensionally. We always look at breath as being something in the front. We've got to look behind us as well. It's really critical. So the diaphragm is like a big jellyfish, all right? When we breathe in, it opens up, and then when we breathe out, it actually compresses just like a jellyfish, and it actually pushes gases just like a jellyfish is pushing water out through its body. So that's how the diaphragm works. Um, it, critical for obviously for respiration, so we're getting more oxygen into the body when we use our diaphragm right, but it's also, this is what's critical for golf, is that it's a stabilizer. Okay, we always used to learn, at least when I was first uh, getting into fitness and stuff, it's about hollowing out that belly, you know, it's creating that Pilates belly and so forth. Well, we learned that was pretty wrong. Bracing is critical. So that means allowing your belly to actually go out when you're bracing as opposed to pulling in. We found that by pulling in on the belly and doing all these crunches, we're actually ruining people's discs. It's putting so much pressure on the spine when we do curls. So better off doing plank stuff and minimizing some of that curl stuff. Um, and then the sphincter stuff is just, it's able to close off certain areas. Okay. And this is kind of the pressure that we're creating to create that stabilization of the core, right? So what's the core? So, you know, back in the day when core in the 90s, no, excuse me, in the 80s when it first started to come out, this term. So we looked at the core being from here to here. So the core in reality is anything that attaches to your pelvis and hips. Okay, so that means from here all the way down below the knee. So that's our core, and our core is three-dimensional, right? So inner thigh, outer thigh, front of the body, back of the body, all those things need to be looked at when you're looking at core strength. And I think core strength is a misnomer. I think it should be core stability or core control because we're really controlling energy. So the core's job is to transfer energy. It's not a mover. It's not a bicep. It's actually there to transfer energy from your lower body to your upper body. So when people have core cueing, they're really trying to cue all those muscles to be able to protect the body with that bellows that you're creating with the diaphragmatic breath. Okay. There's another little shot of it. And again. Okay, here's a great challenge right here. It's called balloon breathing. You can look it up on the worldwide internet as well. If you really want to be challenged with your breath, this is a way to do it. So if you took a balloon, imagine this in your mind's eye. Take a balloon, put it in your mouth, laying on your back, put your feet up against the wall just like this fellow is doing. And then you take a breath in through your nose, balloons in the mouth. Now blow it out. Here's the keeper. Now without pinching the, the tip of that balloon off, Take another breath in through your nose. If you can imagine holding the breath into that balloon with your core strength, that's what this little exercise is showing you how to do. So give it a try just to kind of, you know, amaze your friends and so forth. But it's a really great challenge. And if you if you think you got a, a strong core, there's your checks and balances right there. Through breathing, yeah, yeah, just through breath, baby steps for sure. And then we talked about mobility. Remember, mobility is about joint mobility, right? So um, next. And again, the definition, mobility is how a joint moves, flexibility, how, how long a muscle is. And so this is a great shot of mobility, OK? Here's a guy that's loaded, but he has beautiful form. 
And if anybody's ever tried this move without weights, that's a full squat with arms over the head. Um, Jamie, if we want to have a comedy hour, that would be the one to put everybody through because it's a very humbling position to be in. Just the mobility in your thoracic spine to be able to put your hands up above there is something that we always go for with all the golfers, with, from John Cook to, to Patrick and everybody in between, Mally, et cetera. That thoracic spine is critical. The other part that's critical is the front of your ankles, oddly enough. In fact, the three areas that I give that if you're, if you're lazy, but you want to get better, and you want to really cut to the quick, learn how to breathe, be flexible in the front of your ankles, be mobile in your hips, and be mobile in your thoracic spine. You'll drop the mic right there. That's really critical. Those are the things, if we were going to get out of here with the minimum, that's what you need. And it's a challenge, right? Who's got loose hips in here relative to who's got tight hips, right? Who's got tight hips, right? I'm up in there too, you know, and I work on it all the time. So what you're doing right now is you're feeding your tight hips when you sit, every time you sit. It's called death by chair, and, right? And it's, uh, it's something that we really have to get through. Now, so should I use a stand-up desk? We hear that all the time too, and it's like, yeah, it's a great idea. But now you're going to create problems in the valves in your legs because you're not moving, you're just standing. So now the blood's being pulled to your feet, but you're not activating the valves behind you. So. Stand-up desk, awesome, but be on a surface that's uneven so you keep shifting back and forth. Man was made to move, and life is movement, and movement is life, and we stop moving, we go down. Look at old folks, if they break their hip or they get a pneumonia, boom, it's, it's just, it's almost time to start playing taps because they stop moving, and with that lack of movement goes their health. So life is movement, movement is life. And this is flexibility, Serena. I mean, what an athlete, right? So that's flexibility. That's a big difference. And we see this all the time where someone will come in and it's like, look at me. Look at what I can do. And then you always know that they're showing you that because there's something that, that's, that's really missing in there. So flexibility isn't the end all anymore, whereas it used to be like, gosh, they're so flexible. They'll be great athletes. Well, that's not it. It's mobility. Uh, and, and what we don't want to have is too much mobility in the joints. There's a big thing going on with... Um, gals right now that are into yoga. There is an epidemic of hip surgeries being done because they're getting too mobile in the hips. Instead of stretching the muscles, they're stretching the joints. So that's something to be aware of too. You never want to do a flexibility exercise where you feel it in the joint. You always want to feel it just in the muscles. Okay, so here's an illustration of the last time we all moved well. This is a four-year-old, and then after four-year-olds, the next year we're in school, we start sitting right at the end of us. Well, if you hearken back to that picture of that weightlifter, and you look at his form, and then you look at this little toddler's form, it's perfect. We are built, we have a built-in posture, we have built-in alignment, we have built-in breath, and our society somehow sucks it right out of us and starts to take it away, and we start to degenerate after age four. I mean, it's already a world of entropy. This just speeds it along. So learning to move like a four-year-old is really our goal here. Um, and you'll find that with length, there's strength. So we get these athletes, and I work with a lot of you know NFL guys and, and uh, guys that are in Major League Baseball that just want to get buff. They want to get stronger. And it's insane to me that this is still the goal with a lot of the strength and conditioning coaches that these teams hire is to get them bigger, stronger, faster. Guaranteed, they will not be able to choose when their career ends. Their bodies are going to choose it. It's not about bigger, faster, stronger. I will guarantee you this. Anybody that does this, I will guarantee you that you will be faster, stronger, quicker. You'll have more focus. You'll have more confidence. If you go down this line of alignment, breath, mobility, stability, strength, if you want to get right into the big stuff right away and start strengthening, I guarantee you a lifetime of problems. It's everything that I've been paying attention to for most of my life, and this is a pearl that I want to drop to you. This is the way to go. Death by chair. And uh, you can look up this little, it's a great infographic on, on, the, on the internet. It's called, uh, yeah, Sitting is Killing You, apropos, all right? So after 20 minutes, sorry about that. 
after 20 minutes of sitting, you can't reverse the effects of what you just did. So if I go run a marathon after eight hours of sitting today, I get credit for the marathon, but I've degenerated my body for those eight hours that I could never get back. You, you can tell a person's mortality by how many hours they sit during the day. On average in the United States, we sit 9.2 hours a day. Sit 9.2 hours a day, that's nuts. We sleep 7.7 .7 hours a day on average. We're sitting more than we're sleeping. We've got to get up out of chair. Chairs are the worst thing of all time. So, you know, I recommend uh, getting some really nice carpets on the floor, something soft so that you can sit on, and be able to move. Get on the floor. Be a floor dweller. You'll be amazed how much you move. You know, on average, when we sleep, we move every 20 minutes. There's a reason for that, right? And now we find out from Jan, Jan Vicaris from uh, NASA, who gave us the information on every time you sit for longer than 20 minutes, there's an issue. Now we look at that. 20 minutes, and then our body naturally moves when we sleep every 20 minutes. I think somebody's trying to tell us something here. So it's really interesting stuff. Um, all right, so devices, you know, this is, <laughs> this is the truth. This is where we talked about the weight of the melon here. So, you know, when you're really looking down on that thing, it's about 70 pounds there. So, you know, we wonder why we get headaches and stress and so forth. Um, you know, that's a pretty good reason. So we want everything always to be on the horizon, okay? So we want the chest and the eyes always looking in the same direction, all right? We don't want the chest looking at the ground, neither do we want the eyes looking at the ground. Eyes are always on an imaginary horizon forever. Um, this is called uh, upper and lower cross syndrome. Anybody know this one here? So upper and lower cross syndromes are, uh, everybody has it. Everybody has it. There's not one person that doesn't have it. And these are imbalances that are predictable in all of us. And it's based upon kind of our society. So what we do all day long is in front of us. So our chest gets really tight. And when our chest gets tight, our shoulders roll forward. When our shoulders roll forward, our head gets pulled forward. When our head gets pulled forward and our shoulders get pulled forward, our scapulas, our wing bones come out of alignment. Our shoulders are made up of four joints. I mean, I didn't even know that for until I was in school, I thought it was just this one joint here. It's four joints. So it's this one here, it's this one on the outside, it's the area between your shoulder blades as well that make up that joint. So we got four of them. Um, so rhythm and synchrony becomes really important and when muscles are out of balance in there, our shoulders don't function well. And so when I'm seeing a major league pitcher that's lost 10 miles an hour off his fastball, I know where to go based upon this. And you guys and gals can also now have a nice cheat sheet. Look this up. Everybody's got it. If we have more time, I'd demonstrate on it. It's 10 minutes. OK, and this is what happens to the low back with this lower cross syndrome, OK? So um, there's upper cross syndrome for the upper body and then lower cross syndrome for the pelvis, OK? So when the lower cross syndrome happens in the lower body, this is what we see almost everybody. We, we call it dumping. So it's a pelvic tilt that we get from our hip flexors being so tight. And a, a really good way to tell this when you're looking at your athletes is have them stand with their hands on their hips and arch backwards. So if there's difficulty there, they've got this thing going on in their hip flexors. And like I said, almost everyone does. So you're already starting ahead of the game just knowing what's going on with them. But when the hip flexors are tight, what's crazy about this psoas muscle is it starts in the groin in the front of our bodies and on the inside, and it ends all the way up here in our back, and it anchors to five spots. And so when it's tight, it gives us this curve right here, the shenene. <laughs> and so when you see somebody with their butt tilted out like that, you can put a, a beer on the back there, you know that they're, they've got the lower cross syndrome. But in, in, in all seriousness, uh, almost everybody has this condition. And so the